I will press continue. There we go. So, Cherry, welcome to my podcast, One for the Road. And I'm absolutely made up that you've agreed to come on and talk to me today. How are you? That's so good, Dave. I feel like we're buddies already. I know. Um, and we were having a chat previous to this, and I went to the Azul's, as does pretty pick. Start again. <laughs> All, right. All right. Ready? Yeah, boys. Hi, Cherry. Welcome to my podcast, One for the Road. And I'm absolutely made up that you've joined me today. How are you? I'm really well. I'm really, I'm really made up to be here because I feel like we're already buddies because we've connected on Instagram and I just love the message you're giving out. And so when you asked me, I was so happy. I know. And I, I was just keeping my fingers crossed because I didn't know because... You know, I've sort of curtain twitched your Instagram here and there, and I know that you did dry January, and uh, and then I started doing a little bit of interrogation. You know, I wasn't stalking you, but I I, <laughs> I look back and and I've seen that you've done a couple of documentaries on alcohol, and I think the first one was Cherry Goes Drinking, uh, and the other one was Old Before My Time, and I'm I will say that I haven't seen that before. And I've watched half of it this morning and uh, it highlights the dangers of drinking, right? Yeah. Well, one of the boys, we went to we went to visit lots of people who had different conditions that were making them prematurely aged, but severely um, prematurely aged. And one of the subjects we covered was alcohol. We went to, we went to hang out with some really young guys, so like uni guys. And one of them, and they're like their whole, their whole bants, you know, like uni bants, their whole thing was like going out drinking like really hardcore. And one of the guys had been diagnosed with pancreatitis. I didn't at the time know what pancreatitis was, but it's really, really serious. And you don't really, it's very difficult if, if not impossible to treat it. And yet I don't think he really, he, he said, I'm so, I'm so scared of being thrown out of our friendship group that I would rather go drinking even though I know that I've got pancreatitis. And I don't know what's happened to that man boy but um i think probably he's he's very unwell if not worse but he we, he went out he got absolutely can i swear on this yes well, really he's got shit faced and i just watched him get absolute yeah. i mean i couldn't believe it and i just thought this is su it's actually suicide but he was so scared of losing his friends and the kind of follow-on brought from that i was like and i didn't really have this revelation at the time but I thought, in fact, I'm only kind of having it right now. That boy would rather die than be than be locked out of his friendship group. And that friendship group requires drinking. Mm. That's just the, that was just how it was. That is just what it was. It's really scary because by the time this podcast is aired, I would have done this talk in a college. Um, that is this Monday. And, it, and it's uh, aimed at 16 to 19 year old people that are being a similar mindset of actually I I would feel really like awkward to turn a drink down especially for boys you know yeah it, it would be like what's the matter with you what's wrong with you and that, so they would rather escape that conversation and have a drink and get absolutely pissed you know what I mean what where does that come from? I mean, is it the does it go as far back as Vikings? Cavemen, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I suppose it's like we all like to lose ourselves a bit, which is so funny because actually the older I've got, and as you know, like I, I stopped drinking completely at Christmas because over lockdown, my drinking, my drinking's been escalating over the last, I would say, three or four years. Like I've noticed. I never used to drink at home. And then I remember having, I remember when I had my daughter, this was like 10 years ago. And I was so tired. I remember having, I remember the day that I had a glass of wine at home. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I can drink at home. Now at the time it was so exciting because I just didn't ever consider it. First, I didn't have enough money really to drink a lot of alcohol. And I was working as a runner at the BBC and then a researcher and then an, um, an AP. So I was really, really busy. My friends didn't have any money either. So we didn't drink loads because we were all working incredibly hard in our, um, and I was so ridiculously passionate about working in television. At that time I was behind the cameras. Um, alcohol just didn't play a part in my life really. And then I had my daughter and I started earning a bit more money. I was at home a lot more. 
so being out drinking was never really a problem for me because at first also I love dancing. So the minute the music's on, mm, yeah, thing I'm going to be doing is queuing at the bar. What are you crazy? This is my jam. <laughs> I just never drank. Like at uni, I didn't drink at uni. I hung out with these like evangelical Christians, and we were in a break dance crew. <laughs> So I was, I break danced my way, broke danced my way through uni. Um, and if you're break dancing, you cannot have a drink because you'll kill yourself. Yeah. So I didn't really drink at uni that much. In my twenties, I was obsessed with my career. And then I had kids and that's really the time when people wind down. <laughs> that's the opposite for me is when I start to wind up because I had this revelation. Oh my God, I'm at home. I've had such a mad day. Like looking after a kid can be so challenging. It can be incredibly boring. Yeah. And then really stressful at the end of the day, just when you're knackered, that's when you have to do the most activity. So I started to treat myself with a glass of wine and I was all like, I can have a glass of wine at home, glass of wine at home. And then gradually, gradually. And then unfortunately I had, we got, I got divorced, which is really stressful. I mean, my, my the divorce, my ex-husband's like the nicest man ever. He's divine, but it just wasn't the right future for me. Yeah. But then after that, I think instead of instead of finding calm and finding tranquility, I medicated that stress with alcohol and wine at home. And so my my Achilles heel when it comes to alcohol is not drinking out, it's drinking at home and the mum culture of drinking and how acceptable it is. You know, oh, my God, gin o'clock, wine o'clock. Let's have five margaritas before you've even made supper. Oh, and then I'll have another glass of wine. So it started to escalate like that. And I would all, and I would never ever drink before I worked. And then that start, that boundary went as well. So I'd be like, I, I'd go filming and I'd have a glass of wine while we had supper. You know, the team has dinner, and then I'd have a glass of wine or two in my room. And it just escalated to a point where, and then lockdown happened, and I was drinking a bottle of wine a night, like easy peasy, like. <laughs> Easy peasy. And not my boyfriend, my current partner, who I've been with for four and a half years, totally does, doesn't drink in the week, wouldn't even cross his mind. And during the weekend, he'll have like a couple of cocktails on a Friday night, maybe a glass of wine on Saturday, but that's it. And he's, he's been like that for the whole of our relationship. But my drinking, he's been watching it grow and grow and grow. Even though my life has actually become happier and more stable and more tranquil. The drinking, I was caught in the slippery slope, even though this, my circumstances were getting in be better, the drinking had a kind of mind of its own. And then at Christmas, I, the flags just got too loud. And I realized that the biggest flag was that I kept saying to myself, I'm not gonna drink today. And then I would drink at five o'clock. Mm. And I thought, shit, this is, it's, I'm, it's actually out of control now. I never got drunk. I never felt too bad the next day, but I was living with a constant fogginess. I was never like me. I'm like this all the time. I um, like, you could tell I'm very high energy. I would say I'm quite high joy. Yeah. <laughs> high energy has like a bad connotation to it. So I can also be really quiet and really calm, but I am high joy. <laughs> I, I, I'm very, very happy to be alive. That's my feeling yeah. I yeah. have. And that would, that had kind of gone. And I was living with a with a kind of get, getting through the day. Maybe maybe invisible to the naked eye. Probably lots of times not invisible. Like you could you could tell. And at Christmas, I just had a bit of a revelation. My dad, who has struggled with alcohol all his life, which is why when I saw that flag, I didn't ignore it. I was really really scared because I can see what life what that life is. Um, and my poor dad really really suffered quite badly. Um, and it's possible that he saved me. So thank you, dad. Um, unfortunately, my dad got really ill with pancreatitis, pan pancreas cancer. And, um, and I realized that this, I just couldn't, what was I doing? What was I fucking doing? And I had a couple of really, really intense nights of just really asking for help and like saying, I do not want this to get to the point where I'm in a worse position where I can't just, I don't want to get into a position where this is any worse. Mm. And I do, I believe I'm God, I believe in God. I have like, I don't have a religion. I'm not attached to a religion, but I have a very strong 
belief in God. I don't know why. I just do. It's just there. A, or a connection to the source, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And so I, I reconnected myself with that very closely anyway. And so and then I quit alcohol completely. And I told everyone because I wanted to be accountable. Yeah. I told everyone. I told my boyfriend, I told my mom. Um, I didn't tell Instagram yet because I just wanted it to be. But I told everyone who was around me a lot. I told my best friends, anyone that hung out with. I am not drinking. I don't know if I'll ever drink again, but I'm not drinking. Um, and there were some days that it was difficult. And I would say to my boyfriend, I really want to drink tonight. And just by saying it to him, it helped. Yeah. Just by saying it to him, I didn't mean, I didn't want him to police me. I didn't, I just needed to say, I have this real urge to drink tonight. Yeah. And then it was like, this, that shadow had gone. Anyway, so I did three months and I fucking loved it. <laughs> it was amazing. I got myself back. Yeah. I got my joy back. I just was like, I was way more annoying. <laughs> I was so annoying. Because normally in the evening, I'm all like, you know, by the time kind of half nine comes, you know, or nine o'clock when me and my boyfriend are like sitting on the sofa. Normally, if I've drink, drunk wine, I'm a bit like, boo, 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 boo. but <laughs> when I was not drinking, I was like, hi, hey, <laughs> what should we talk about? Oh, my God. I was, you know, and I, that obviously calmed down, but I was just so happy to have myself back. Yeah. And then, three months I started to experiment with well can I have like the occasional drink and what will happen then mm. and what I found was initially I was I'd extended Saturday and Sunday to Thursday and Monday so that became a problem I was like okay so now I need to be really really disciplined so that's where I'm at at the moment Dave so what I'm doing is do not drink during the week love it don't even want one not tempted I don't think about it I just don't, I just don't want it. And I'm having, I'm allowing myself like a couple of drinks at the weekend. I'm seeing how that's going. Yeah. But I'm also questioning why I even want those. So that's where I'm at. It's really fascinating because after three months, you just explained that you felt absolutely amazing. So can you tell me, did you think I can handle it now or I'm in control of the drinking and I'll be able to moderate or did you just think right I'm going to see what happens like a little experiment like a little experiment all the way through my life I've done like little experiments on myself like at university I decided to give up sex and drinking to see what would happen um and that wasn't that because I was <laughs> it wasn't because I was hanging out with evangelical Christians I think they were almost came second but I just wanted to see what it was like you know in my in my um early 20s you know late teens I had discovered sex it wasn't like I'd had tons but I had had some sex and some boyfriends some really like loving relationships fortunately but I've done experiments like that all my life like I give up things often in my life to see how I what well, sometimes I'll just go right can I get up at six in the morning for two weeks yeah. let's see what happens when I do that so I'm very experimenting on myself in all things, like foods, like oh, all things. So yes, it's an experiment at the moment, but I'm interrogating it constantly. Like what I don't know, Dave, is am I doing it because I personally need the release of getting out of my head? In which case, why? What am I trying to get away from? I think I know the answer to this. Or is it socially? Am I worried that? I'll be I'll be weird socially with some of my friends who do drink so that I need to know like I can drink at the weekends and then pull it back I don't I think it's probably a mixture of the two why did you decide to cut it out completely rather than try and moderate um well I did try and moderate um but I was hardcore I mean I was drinking ridiculous amounts of alcohol I mean to be honest if I didn't hadn't have met my wife Emma yeah I'd probably be dead now yeah uh, because when I lived on my own I had no one to be accountable to I was locking myself in so I had my own party going on Cherry it's like ridiculous like I would stock up on a Friday and go into my house and come out Monday morning looking like Columbo don't you, you know? think that, that home that home drinking you know, we, we, when we talk about drinking, when, when I do shows about drinking, we, we always use GVs of people in, you know, student towns getting hammered yeah. on the street and falling over in their past dresses. I, I don't think that's the real problem. I mean, that's the gateway. That is the gateway. But really, when you start drinking 
at home, like really drinking, that to me is the biggest fucking flag. If that is someone, if that is you, if that is anyone watching yeah. this, or if, and when I talk to my friends, like you got to watch that. That is, dang- to me, that's danger zone. Uh, it, it's dangerous because it's free pouring for a start. You know, when you go to the bar and you say, oh, if you kept going up saying, can I have a bottle of wine, please? Can I have a bottle of wine? And you're sitting on your own in the corner. They're going to know what's wrong with that yeah. guy, you know? Yeah. But for me, it was like, um, I, was, I wasn't accountable to anyone. And I used to go AWOL with everyone as well. So at a certain period, I'd go, do you know what? Um, I'm going to look at my phone, but only on social media. I'm not going to text anyone in case they ring me up. I mean, how scary is that? Yeah, I'm fine, actually. I'm doing well. How are you? And then it starts ringing. And you're like, no, I won't even be able to talk because I'm so drunk. Oh, you know? it's awful. So, such just, it's the shame is so awful. Yeah. But alcohol is such a wily beast. Yeah. Because I don't like personifying things particularly because I think it gives them too much power. But uh, so, so many of the books that I've read have personified alcohol. And it's been, I think it's useful for some people, but... It closes all your doors and windows and curtains and it unplugs your phone right. and it turns and turns off your phone, puts it on silent mode so that it can just have you all to itself. Yeah. There a couple of times that again, like I woke up next morning, I was like, shit, I spoke to mom. Like, was I drunk? Yeah. And I thought, what the, what is this? Yeah. What is, I work so hard to create a good life for myself. Like I stay in touch with my friends. I call everyone back. I... We go. I do, I work out every single morning. I kind I try and be as gentle and as kind as I can to my kids. Like I work really hard. I'm really good with money. I never spend more than I have. Blah, blah, blah. And the drinking was like me smashing my life with a hammer. There's a really good advert on at the moment. I see it all the time, and I I just feel like I wish it was on every poster ever. And it was like it's just someone sitting on a huge alcohol bottle bottle of alcohol, and it says alcohol will take everything from you and it's really simple mm. there's something it's not quite that phrase but it's essentially alcohol will just slowly yeah. take everything Strips from you of everything and uh, and it's very slow it's yeah, very it's devious. Slow. it's devious because what really? you say about drinking indoors so let's talk about lockdown right i remember when we first went into it it, it was actually quite warm wasn't it um lovely it was beautiful Army. so it felt like for a lot of people it's like a holiday and then there was that thing, house party, right? So everyone was going on house party, getting pissed, basically, right? Yeah. And I was looking at it thinking, but I can see how. You know, I'm not one of these people like an ex-smoker that's going, eh, it's the smoke of the devil. And Although I do hate it, I will say that. But um, it, it, it was, I was watching everyone. And then I started to think, do you know what? The more it went on, the more I could see what was going to happen, you know, throughout the summer, and then it gets its wiry claws into you. And then it's like being in a possessive relationship with someone who's really jealous or something, you know, and they want you all to themselves and that. And then you can't get away because they won't let you away. And in the morning you wake up and you think, I've got to get out of this relationship. But by lunchtime, you're like, but I love him or I love her. And and then by the afternoon, they're wearing their perfume or aftershave and they're luring you in with their... Do you know what I mean? And by five That's o'clock, a good you're back way of it. Yeah. And then you're back. And I agree. I mean, that, that I mean, it got me. It hundred yeah. percent got me. hundred percent got me. Um, you know, and I do, like I say, you know, I, I was starting to have alcohol before I, you know, if I was going filming and I'd have drinks with people in the bar, you know, but really I'd, I'd, I'd be pretty moderate, you know, really moderate. But um, during lockdown, there was very little filming. So there was very, and there was no school run. Yeah. It wasn't really anything to make you go, shit, I need to pull this in. Yeah. So it was really easy for everyone. And also society gave us every reason in the world to drink. Yeah. Oh, it's so difficult. Have a drink. Oh my God, we've got claustrophobia. Have a drink. Oh, homeschooling's a nightmare. Have a drink. Mm. And I feel angry with myself. Not angry. No, I don't. I feel really proud of myself, actually. That's my feeling. Um, I feel frustrated that the messages are so pervasive because when I stopped drinking, we were still in lockdown after Christmas, mm. that joyful, that joyful uh, last lockdown where everyone was like, ah! <laughs> I, we were still in lockdown. 
And I'm going to say, and people will punch me in my little face, but I really enjoyed that lockdown. Yeah. I went running every day. I even went swimming in the river, even though it was cold. I was like a newborn baby. I was patient with my kids. I slept really well. I created this really lovely evening routine where I would journal while my son was, my daughter was in the bath. We would shout at each other and make each other laugh. I put on this really calming piano music that I love. There was this absolute tranquility in the house. I went to bed at half nine every night. I read loads. It was like, I just, I'm, I'm frustrated that I didn't have that experience before. I think my kids would have had a much, a much calmer home teacher and I would have been super fit and I would, however, I'm also grateful for lockdown because it pushed my drinking into the next level. And I was not busy with my life to ignore it. So it was this kind of perfect storm for me. I was quiet. I was quiet enough to see it. And I didn't have, I wasn't going out with my friends, so I couldn't legitimize it with, oh, but it's it's Jeff's 50th. Oh, it's, got, oh, it's Susan's leaving do. I had none of that. It was just cherry drinking at home on the sofa. Yeah, that was there's it. a documentary there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cherry drinking at home on the sofa. Well, do you know, I made Cherry Goes Drinking. That was the first documentary I ever made. And we looked at why people drank. And that was yeah. almost exactly 10 years ago. Yeah. And I kind of feel like I want to make Cherry Doesn't Go Drinking 10 years later. Um, I'll be in it. Be no, in it. no, it's interesting. Um, and, and I love the way you think. I think we're quite similar. You know, because I explore myself. That sounds wrong. I explore myself. <laughs> Did that um, too? <laughs> um, quite a lot. I do a lot of self-analysis, you know, and, and for me that works both ways because it can wear you out, but also it can be really brilliant for finding out the reasons why you do things, you yeah. know. So what interests me like now is that you've had this three months off. You realised that brought out the best in you. And then you went back to drinking to see if you could manage it. But now you've reached a place where you don't even think about it in the week, which goes to show how strong the power of the mind is that you can yeah. just, because for most people, right, they've got their opening hours, which are mainly in the evening, right? So if you said to them, have a drink at 10, they go, oh, don't be revolting. Like, so why at five do you then think, oh, it's okay, it's one o'clock now? Because it's yeah. in the mind, you know? Absolutely. That if you could, what I realized when I was first giving up drinking was that was my danger zone. Five to eight. Yeah. Three I hour can, window. Uh, yeah. If I can get past eight. So I had lots of different techniques. So I would do always every evening do something really lush. Um, when we weren't in lockdown, I would spend the money that I would have spent on wine. I spent it on a masseuse to come to the house on a Friday evening, which was margarita time. And that was my yeah. danger. Thing. So I would get a masseuse to come and give me a massage. And I have no apologies for how bougie that sounds because it was cheaper than the wine I had been drinking previously. Self-care. And so I would get through and I would walk around in my dressing gown on a Friday evening, like bam, 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 feeling million dollars and knowing that I would wake up tomorrow feeling even better. <laughs> it was like... Friday evenings became just as fun. And me and my boyfriend put like all the duvets on the on the sofa and we'd watch some really cool sci-fi and get a takeaway. And it, so it wasn't, I found, I made sure that I, I gave myself joy. I surrounded myself with, a, and during the weekday, every night, a delicious bath with something really gorgeous in it. Something really delicious. Because I think that's the problem is that wine, you know, is that about Pavlovian response? Like wine is treat, wine is delicious. Yeah. So when... Yeah. When I first gave up, I hadn't, I did, wasn't doing that. And I really felt this weird silence. I said to my boyfriend, Carl, when I literally in the first week of giving up, I was like, I don't know what to do with this feeling because it's five, six, seven. Have you ever been on an escalator that stopped working and you have to walk up it? That's what it felt like. It felt wrong. It felt uncomfortable. Oh, I wasn't wow. used to being conscious, like really meerkat conscious during those hours and I felt really 
weird like I was at a party I shouldn't have been to or when someone says a really nasty little bit she comments to you and then walks off and you're like so I realized that that was the time when I had to be like I love you and do something like delicious light all the candles and just I used all my expensive products in the bath it didn't fucking matter because this was the time to do it mm. and so anyone I always think anyone who's trying to cut down or give up wear your favorite cashmere whatever it light that candle you've been saving you've got to just I would say I don't know how you feel about this ease yourself into a different way of being because it's quite a big jump to go from drinking every day to nothing yeah it's I love that. I absolutely love it because I always say to people, stick a tenner, 20 quid into a pot. Yes. At the end of the 30 days, right, you've got 600 quid, say 500. You could go away for a weekend or you could do a spa weekend, you know, like really, really treat yourself because drinking is like a, a reward to your brain. So when you remove it, it's easily you can become a victim and go, What's in it for me? You know, and that's the real wrong mindset to be because you've got to remind there's yourself. Why you... There's this really strong sense of, oh, God, what if I can't have that? And, and I'm saying that in that voice, but this is this was me. This was yeah. me. I, I remember at Christmas getting, I think, because I gave up before New Year, but I was like, I had the I had the feeling in me, so I knew I needed to do it. Yeah. Um, and also I got really bad acid reflux, so I was like, I need to fucking, I need to stop this now. So I remember sitting there at New Year's Eve with Carl, my boyfriend. We weren't even allowed to really go out. I remember sitting there going, God, it can't even. And because I had acid reflux, I couldn't have rich food. <laughs> I was such a bitch. I sat there going, can't believe I can't even have something nice to eat. And I can't even drink. <laughs> <laughs> but like, what? But as, as though there was nothing else in the world. I know. You there put an old else. tin mug <laughs> under the tap and go. Do you know what I mean? It's like this because my my enjoyment and my and my treats were had been a really for you know more than a decade treat fun celebration. Oh my gosh, it's my birthday! Oh my gosh, the cat walked in! Oh my god, I had a bad day. Alcohol, 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 yeah, alcohol. That is what our society says. I also feel like the the you know the blindfold's been taken off me yeah. and i look at, i look at alcohol adverts and it's always this brazilian going da 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 <laughs> and then she's like at the end she's like bacardi or like whatever there are other spirits available. Yeah, yeah. but i think i know well, that's interesting because i since i've been since i've massively reduced my alcohol i have been more up on the dance floor and more chatty. So what, you know, yes, it does lower your inhibitions, but if, I mean, this, this, comes, this comes to a really important thing, is what if you are someone, and I'm naturally quite a confident person, as I'm sure you can tell, what happens if you want to give up alcohol, but you really, really need it to function in society? What do you do then? What, what advice would you give to someone if they came to, because I know you do this, you do coaching. Yeah. What well, would you give to someone if they're like, I cannot go to a social occasion unless I'm slightly pissed or unless I've had a drink. Yeah. Well, you need to find other ways to um, help yourself with anxiety, which there are, you know, um, and also connect with a community, um, get coaching. Some people go to AA, you know, there, there are lots of sources of help. And I, I'm helping uh, Alcohol Change UK with a campaign, which is Stop the Stigma of Alcoholism. Yeah, I love you know? that. Um, and Sarah Drage, I'm working with, we're talking in a college and because her dad, bless him, Steve, he died at the age of 59, which is so, yeah. not a lot older than me, you know. And, and that's because of the shame of it, because he didn't feel like he wanted to reach out. He felt like a shame that he was drinking and stuff so we're trying to raise it that actually um it's a highly addictive drug that does not discriminate anyone and it's know? a highly addictive drug that society tells us that yeah. our life will be better yeah. with it imagine if imagine if there were adverts and tell you like struggling to have fun try crack yeah Dad, i've always Dad, said that <laughs> If you You're saw so someone uh, injecting heroin on a bench, well, a lot of had a stressful day. What are you talking about? You'd have something to say, you know. But, um, and obviously, the addiction isn't in the same in the same category. And I, you know, I, I'm not in any way poo-pooing or shaming. But I think 
I told a couple of people that no, I I went, I told Instagram that I was giving out alcohol, that I was struggling with it, that become like it, I was not finding it a positive thing in my life. I had a couple of people, absolute well wishes, really good friends, saying, really, should you be talking about this on Instagram? Really? Really don't, yeah. And they just because they were looking at me, they were like, this is, doesn't look good for your profile, doesn't look good for your doesn't look good for your brand. Um, and I thought, no, it doesn't. And there are some people who will think, oh, and they'll make up a narrative. Yeah, yeah. But I, what I want to, and I know you feel like this too, I wish people could ask for help before it got really bad. I was I lucky, weirdly, and I thank my father. Unfortunately, he's passed away, but um, he died. So I have a really, really um, visceral example of what happens if you don't say I'm struggling. And my poor dad he, he didn't say for a very long time so it got really really bad and so I feel very grateful that I and I'm again naturally thank thankfully I'm quite an open person anyway mm. so I was able to ask for help before I think it got too bad it just there were some flags that I could see and I took them really fucking yeah. seriously I want people to be able to say I this isn't I was isn't in a really I, I I'm not in a good space without everyone thinking, oh, well, you're an alcoholic. You're well, a liability. Well, there's this stigma straight away, you see. That's that's the thing. So they advertise it everywhere, Christmas cards, or they make you believe that um, you can relax or dance or have a party with alcohol, gives you confidence. We all think, oh, we, we need a good night's sleep, so I'm going to have a couple of drinks, nightcaps and whatever. It's all absolute rubbish. But... Come I on, think... have a baby. The first thing they do is give you a glass of champagne. You've just had, you've just given birth to new life. Yeah. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll, you know, I enjoyed it, but it is a funny, it's a funny way of doing yeah. things. It's you know? a reward, isn't it? But, yeah. no, but do you know what? I think um, like the difference between men and women are, I, I mean, I'm a grey area drinking coach, which removes the category of you either drink or you're an alcoholic. You know, so there's a big thing in the middle there, which is really interesting. What would you uh, say? So is is grey area. So if you're a grey area drinker, is it that point in which you say, right, I'm I'm not on the park bench, which is your classic kind of. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Not many people end up on the park bench. They end up on their sofa. Yeah. At nine o'clock on the third bottle of wine. That's the danger zone. But is it people who think I'm there are different. Like, like in the way I was, I was like, there are flags here and I'm not happy with it. How 100%. Do I do it? So, it, so if I was to say to you when you were drinking, just stop, that's it, you're done, you'd be thinking, actually, I, I don't want to or I can't, but you haven't reached a rock bottom, right? So the majority of clients that I have, they are in that category where maybe they have a couple of um, glasses of wine with dinner i spoke to laura hamilton who presents place in the sun and she just said to me do you know what dave i just have a couple of glasses of wine that's it i'm done so i'm okay i said well actually that is over double your units per week and all the health implications that and she didn't know and she's lovely laura and and, and she's nipped that in the bud now because it's about education but it's also about owning up to yourself and thinking how is alcohol affecting my life? Is one glass affecting if you're present with your children at bedtime, uh, if it makes you slightly irritable, if, as you said in the beginning, like about this hazy feeling. So you don't have to be drinking a bottle of wine a night. It, you know, it could be a couple of glasses on a Friday night, but Saturday you feel crap or whatever. And, and it's that conversation you need to have with yourself is actually what is it offering me in my life? What, what am I, I trying get? So if, if I'm really present with you now, like you can feel I'm present. Mm. I can feel I'm present. I'm really here. One glass of wine, I can feel I start to go. Yeah. And I start to go and I start to go. My big question to myself was, what are you, why are you going? Yeah. Where are you going? Where, what are you leaving from? And that's, um, and I mentioned it before we, we came on air, but um, I realized that I struggle sometimes to exist in the world. <laughs> that sounds like quite a big thing to say, but I realized now I've had lots of therapy for, for various reasons, you know, partly to kind of help me, you know, um, think about how to manage, you know, dad struggled a lot with alcohol and, and that, you know, has its things. But um, 
so I've had therapy for like 10 years on and off. And then when I got divorced, my therapist was incredibly helpful with how to manage that. So I realized that I was drinking to manage, I think, what is anxiety. And I've always thought people who have anxiety, like have panic attacks and it's quite acute. Um, and I hate to use that thing, oh, I have anxiety because it feels like, God, everyone does. But so what I think I'm going to phrase it as more is that I'm so sensitive. Yeah, I was going to come on to that. I feel, I feel everything. Yeah, yeah. And I feel it too much. So at the end of the day, I'd have, it's like getting a lifeboat and going, oh, yeah, I can stop feeling and I can stop caring. So that's when I gave up drinking in December. I realized that yeah. the hardest thing was having to feel the feelings. <laughs> can I just feelings. add one to there? And you could tell me if I'm wrong, right? Because I'm hypersensitive as well, which is a superpower yeah. if used correctly. Yes. But I was also a huge overthinker. And was you? Because with me, oh, that hypersensitive trait in me would make me think about everything think about what someone said that day think about how I reacted to this think about how I should do this so when I had a drink it would actually stop me thinking so much and that was like a huge relief because it was like a voice in my head and I wanted to go shut up how can I shut it up was by having a drink so when I stopped the voice got louder because I had more to think about because I wasn't blunting my emotions anymore so and how I, did you, so how did you, because that for me, the giving up drinking really was a lot easier than I thought it would be. Yeah. Because I was treating myself so good. The hard thing was to like, oh, now I have to feel the feelings. And I, I, catastrophize. I catastrophize. I think, oh my God, that person hasn't called me back or this person didn't yeah. rehire me for the job. They must have thought I was crap or they must have thought I was shit and loads of really negative. Yeah, negative, yeah. Such a waste of space. You're so, oh, my friends haven't called me for a while. They must hate me. They've, they've probably got, got together in a gang and decided that I'm I'm hopeless. Yeah. Oh, it's very um, difficult. I'm 40 and I'm glad I've caught it now. Yeah. But I, I refuse to continue my life with that kind of turd thoughts in my mind. So I, that has been the biggest thing that I've done this year is oh. I've done tons of reading about what it is to be a high, a super empath, about what it is to live in the world. Instead of having this, instead of being highly empathetic and sensitive, and because I've not grasped it, it's a weakness, I'm turning it into a strength because I'm learning how to stop myself catastrophizing yeah. to be super present because when you're in the present you're only dealing with what's happening and often what's happening is really really nice and really wonderful so I've been you know meditating but even if meditating isn't something that someone would enjoy I mean really what is meditating it's sitting quietly with yourself the power nap <laughs> Um, yeah sometimes people I think are put off meditating because it feels a bit like gong bath and bells and whistles yeah. but one of the things I've been doing is a course um like a manifesting course now Dave I've been meaning to do this for years but I haven't been present enough to do it but then when I gave up drinking after about three months I was just ready so I wrote this manifesting course with my um, friend Nat who I know also manifests and one of the things that we also want to do is we want to start a company called Sensitive Souls. And we want to help people. Nat and I are both training to be counsellors. We want to help people to manage their sensitivity so that it becomes this wild strength. Because in the last year, I feel like it has become this wild superpower that I now am starting to get to grips with. And it's really been a, quite life changing. And I know that you and I are very similar in that that sensitivity and I know that you're either a trained counsellor or training I trained to be a counsellor um when I was drinking which is a whole different story oh. because um I think I would have gone all the way through to the end and be a qualified counsellor now but I completely messed it up through drinking when I was doing all my homework <laughs> sending off well ridiculous <laughs> I know, ridiculous 1500 word essays. When I press send, it's like literally I've smashed that to uh, to going in Thursday to college and being hauled into another room going, what the hell is this? 
Um, but I've always had the interest anyway, you know, in, in how we think. I love that, how, I, you know, I kind of analyse myself yeah. and you, and, and I've got that natural sort of sixth sense of... I can feel it in you, absolutely. Yeah, and and absolutely. so um, I trained to be a grey area drinking coach because that kind of suited how I look at most people who drink now. Mm. Um, so mm. I love that whole whole sort of self-work but when you say about empathy and also um you studying to be a counselor one of the biggest incredible gifts is to be able to listen right but to listen to yourself is what i did when i gave up drinking was i listened to all the whys why am i doing this you know why did i get to the the stage i did with my drinking why have I let this affect my marriage so badly and all that? And I used to really sit with myself and think, okay, look, there's two ways out of this. So I have a white knuckle it and probably fail, or I've really got to connect with me, my authentic self and think, okay, let's be super positive about this. And let's change the language around what I say to myself. Mm. And, and that was stopping saying at five o'clock, well, I need a drink. I need to get drunk. I've had a good day, bad day, any day. I, I need this coping strategy. I need to be able to cope on my own and find the real me. And it was just after my mum had died as well. And when, when she died, I was holding her hand and I saw her slip away and she was staring up and I could feel her spirit leave her in that. And it was almost like affected me in such a way that it was almost like she could see me after and was trying to give me a hand and say, Dave, I didn't know this was happening for you. I, I, I knew you loved a drink, but I didn't realise it was that bad. So I almost felt accountable to my mum, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what's kind of kept me going with, like, you reading a lot, educating myself. I'm a geek for sort of all the science around yeah. this and that. And, and that, That's massively, massively helpful. If we, you know, the, the, the kind of language around giving up is so interesting. It, it's giving up is a is a I always yeah. don't like saying yeah, that yeah. what I'm what I'm doing is I'm Dang giving me. I mean that those were the rituals that I created yeah. when yeah. I was you know first giving up and I still do them now I still continue those little rituals in the evening I love our evening ritual I'll create a really gorgeous lovely smelly bath for my kids yeah. Yeah. I'll come in so the bathroom is just like behind there yeah. and then so I can see the kids like if, when I have the door open I sit in here which is despairing but I've got this lovely like beautiful kind of setup which is where I do my work I sit, I have my gorgeous piano music, my candles, I write my what's happened in the day, what I'm grateful for. You know, if there's something that's worrying me, like, why am I worrying? And just kind of releasing that worry. You know, Terry, don't need to worry about that. There's yeah. nothing you can do. Or tomorrow, why don't you call and apologize and check you didn't say it? whatever it is. So I release that worry. And then what I want to happen tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be a, a joyful day. Tomorrow is a gift. That's a big thing. I make sure I say that to myself first thing in the morning. So there's none of this getting out of bed like, oh, I can't believe I have to get out of bed. Oh, I can't be. I wake up in the morning. I think, oh, I've got another day. I'm wait. I've woken up and I feel good. I am not hung over. I'm not sh I'm not worried about what I said or did last night. Wow. Tomorrow's this magical gift and getting in touch with yourself. And so giving up is a not the right phraseology. I think also in terms of the, what you say about yourself. So I wasn't I think for some people, it's really useful to say, I am an addict, because that is a helpful mental process. For me, I think, I hope I caught it before then. And I wanted, I didn't want that because of, especially with my dad, I didn't want that language in my life. Label. So I just, I was, just, and it wasn't even, I didn't even like saying I'm not a drinker. Yeah. Because I also feel like not drinking for me is normal do you see what I mean like I've, I've I've created this little story in my mind I live in my own fantasy land where not drinking is the norm for me yeah so it's not that I'm like oh I'm not drinking today oh I'm sober and I agree that that language is great for other people but for me I just want this is just me and this is how life works actually drinking ethanol yeah is that that's it should be like I'm drinking and I'm a drinker as opposed to people who don't drink having to say something you shouldn't yeah. have to say anything 
Yeah. Just, why is <laughs> I I don't do crack. So, and I'm not just, I'm not, this isn't a disrespect to people who struggle with drug addiction, oh, I, I know. I say, but I'm just using it as a comparison. You know, if you don't do crack, you just go, oh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't do crack. You know, you don't go to a dinner party and say, I'm not doing crack tonight. You know, you just, not drinking is natural. Yeah. It's our natural state. It's where we should be. And I think if people have struggled with anxiety, alcohol is not the solution. It's working out how to live in the world as a sensitive person there's so many other ways to do it yeah yeah i mean some of the techniques that i use is um the polyvagal nerve or vagus what's that it's the nerve at the back of your head right uh and it goes from your neck down and and you can do all these exercises and all this and it actually you, you only need to, to do them for a couple of minutes and it can reset everything you know because we all we all turn to alcohol for a coping mechanism, but there were so, you know, you say you exercise every morning. I've, I've got a PT that it's three times a week. And there are days that I walk down there and I'm like, Ugh. and she says to me, Oh, how are you, Dave? And I go, Oh, do you know what? I've got a bit of headache. Cause I, I want her to say, Oh, let's take it easy today. Then shall we? She will actually make it worse for me. <laughs> like she will do an hour of bloody cardio for me and I'm crawling back out of the gym like, Ugh. but <laughs> do you know what? It makes me feel so much better after, oh, you know, and, and there's um, grounding, you know, walking out in your garden in your bare feet and that. There's lots of different things you can do that floats your boat. Yeah, you know. you know, a really, really, really easy thing that I do. And I do this 10 times a day. I think I used to live up here. You know that? Well, I think my energy used to be up, up here. And then by the end of the day, I'm vibrating so... No wonder I wanted a glass yeah. of wine to bring... Yeah, me. yeah. Now, so instead of living like this, I try and exist like this. Yeah, I, this I now, get this that. Is now where I live. Yeah. But sometimes I'll have... I'll, I'll get an email that's stressful or I have an... So I... Whether it's exciting or stressful, I react in the same way. My... So what I do, and actually I'm talking to you and I've taken my shoes off and my feet are on the floor so that I could stay grounded because I knew that yeah. I'd get, I knew I was really excited to talk to you. So I was like, but just stay grounded. So I do this a lot. I just put my hand on my chest. I take a big breath in and I take a big breath out and I move my hand just down. Mm. And when I've had a conversation with someone or if I bump into someone in the street, I bring myself back down. So throughout the day, I exist here. Yeah. I am nicer. I'm calmer. Yeah. I'm a nicer parent. I'm a happier person from that one gesture from living here. It's, and it's easy to not drink. It's much easier to not drink if you are not full of nerves and anxiety. I feel really calm now after that. Um, you know, like my therapist taught me that. And I was like, <laughs> it's beautiful. And do you know what I get with you? Because you're like me, is you live off your adrenaline. So that's why you have these huge peaks and huge troughs. It's one or the other. And by doing what you did there, a bit of breath work, a bit of like leveling yourself out, grounding and that, and being sort of like that. <sighs> Let's do a, do a five minute breath work session on here. So cherry, breathe deeply. <sighs> There we are. How are you feeling? So much happier. <laughs> I just love it. Don't you love it? Don't you love existing here? Absolutely. Right in the present. And then, before we go, because I know you love a book. This is the book that I really enjoyed reading. Oh, yeah. I've got it. you got Grace. it. Yeah. By Annie Grace, This Naked Mind, Control Alcohol. She says some quite spicy things mm. about it. So I think it may not be for everyone. Mm. But I really liked the psychological... Um, the aspect of it so understanding why we drink now the other one that I really like this is hardcore yeah and about two years ago when I said to my therapist I really think that I need to stop drinking as much she gave me this book and I hid it in a cupboard I'm not joking I hid it in the back of my cupboard because I was so scared because it has the word addiction on it and I was not mm -hmm. even vaguely ready because of watching my father suffer I was so um so it's this book you can see it's been read 
Um, it's wow. by a guy called Tommy Rosen. It's called Move Beyond Addiction and Upgrade Your Life. Wow, now, I haven't seen you, that one. You, not, you do not need to be anywhere close to alcohol addiction to get so much from this book. So I would encourage anyone. You can even put, you can put the lion, the witch and the wardrobe over it. You could put um, 50 shades of gray over it to stop yeah. yourself being embarrassed because it's yeah, better yeah. to read a sex book than to read. This is a, this, he talks about the internal pharmacy. So we yeah. have joy, we have self-soothing, we have um, elation, we have ecstaticness within us. We do not need external substances to get those highs and that joy. Mm. So that is an incredibly powerful book. It is quite hardcore at the beginning. He talks about, he goes, he, he was very, very deep into serious, serious addiction. But the way he talks about release, like freeing yourself is just so badass. So I recommend- uh, And that it. works for you, doesn't it? Because there's some people that like the science. I mean, one of my favorite books is yeah. here and it's um, that one called Drink, Professor Dave. Oh my gosh, yeah. So he's the Don, isn't he? Yeah, I, he's the Don. One. I'm going to get into that one. I was going to get him on my podcast, but when you said you'd come on, he was out the window, trust me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's much better to have cherries than nuts look at that <laughs> i'm way sweeter <laughs> oh that's perfect all right so before we go how do you see your drinking in the next year really interesting i am going to monitor it i i never ever want it to get more than it is now yeah the only way it's going is less mm -hmm. there's no way i'm giving up this this me i'm never i'm never leaving myself again i'm staying with myself i love finding out who i really am sometimes it's scary and sometimes the the anxiety and the nervousness and the overthinking and the catastrophizing well that's fine if i do all those things that's fine i will just work out how to not do them and that's been so it will only come down it will not go up i love it I absolutely love it. And it's a journey, isn't it? You know, it is a journey. And the more you find out about yourself, the more you sort of work other things out in your life. And, and maybe one day you think, Do you know what, I just don't need it. And that's the end of it, you know? I, I've definitely found that my life has got a bit more magical and cool things happen the more present and awake I am. And I've got this post-it note above where I work. And it says, the braver I am, the luckier I get. And that's from a fabulous book called, oh God, oh, I'm just going to get it because if you haven't read this book, you need to read this book. Everyone in the world needs to read. I think everyone in the world has read it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that book. I know. Untamed. I don't think I've ever loved a book. So I couldn't read more than two pages at a time. So I just put it down and be yeah. like. Oh. It's just a fantastic book, isn't I'm it? I'm pretty sure I got that quote from Glennon when she said the the braver I am, like giving up alcohol is very brave because you have to sit with feelings. Yeah. So if you have given up alcohol and you've sat with yourself. Absolutely. And that was you saluting them, by the way, because they couldn't see that. Oh, yeah, I salute you. <laughs> yes. You decided to sit with, sit in the shit, sit with your feelings. That's, That's it. That would be for your book. That would be coming out soon. Sit in the shit. That will be the, <laughs> the title. <laughs> <laughs> Sit in the Shit by Cherry Healy. Uh, and another book that's out is this book, Sober Dave the Memoir, which is amazing. Oh, no, I haven't read it Oh, my it yet. God, have you done a memoir? No, not yet, but you never know what's around the corner. Babes, you know, know it. Uh, I want lots of tips and tricks in it. I don't like, know that. It'd yeah. be a memoir, tips and tricks, and they'd get a free pair of Sober Dave pants with every purchase, <laughs> so... We're laughing. Can, we get, can you design a really cool mug as well? Yeah, what like the one I showed you. Yeah. yeah. You can't yeah. copy that's copyright, it'll be put in present day. <laughs> oh, I do it similar. Oh yeah, just very it's just like tattoos in it. You just have to adjust a little bit and then yeah, you're it. laughing. It's mine. Oh Cherry, thank you so much. I absolutely love you. And I, I love I you too. I love you. what you're doing. I'm such a big fan of yours. I'm cheerleading you every day. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. And I'm really going to follow your journey and see how it takes you. Same. All right. Pleasure, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you, darling. See you later. Anytime. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.